Hello, everyone. I, um, I recognize some faces, and you might have heard of this project. Um, this is a project we've built with um, Arab, as in we're in the process of getting it ready. Um, and indeed, a uh, future of construction because Arab got really excited by the idea of using digital fabrication at a scale that was unprecedented. So instead of 3D printing or reinventing materials uh, using compressive um, arms, robotic arms that we call in series, uh, we thought that using parallel robotics, which is when all the lines are basically defined uh, straight, straight, uh, straight ahead with the, the code, would be much more uh, kind of easy to use, cheap, and convenient for uh, construction scale buildings. Um, so I'm going to take you through the journey of making this happen. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm not a robotics expert. I come from the world of uh, 3D printing and digital fabrication. In fact, I have a, a fab lab of my own. So I'm going to explain a bit why we came to that and where we are at now. Um, I've been uh, pitching for this project to uh, Arup, which is a, a big firm that you might all know. Um, and especially Francis Archer, who was extremely supportive. Our team has to, had to evolve. Uh, we now hired um, you know, people that are in robotics, uh, including uh, astrophysicist trainings and things like this. So it's kind of interesting to see that instead of just remaining as an architect, um, I would say an office that explores that type of um, technology has to break walls. And in many ways, I've always seen this through our journey and through uh, the use of digital tools, not just the fabrication, but the, uh, um, the software that is needed to generate these geometries. So I'll take you through a couple of our projects in which we had to do that process and what led us to really switch to such a technology. Uh, this is our printer. It's quite big. It's not necessarily big enough to do buildings, but it allowed us to explore things like custom um, what we call G-code. G-code is the way that you send information to a uh, 3D printer. Um, some 3D printers don't have this. Uh, they, they, may, they might hide it from you, <laughs> but basically an X, Y, Z and an E value is what allows you to control your printer. So we're extruding uh, plastic through a little tube that heats up and we're sending a very easy information. So if you have control of that information, you can do things that are a bit unusual. You can accelerate while you print, you can extrude more, over extrude, under extrude, um, and get things that are a bit more uh, exciting out of your printer than just a representation of a model. Uh, this is the typical interface, so uh, we called it Silkworm with uh, the friends with, uh, who we did this. Um, Adam Holloway mostly, I'm gonna credit him. Um, but this is the, um, the G code that you'll have. Um, so X, Y, Z, and E. Um, and so you plug in these and then it outputs that and you just put this straight away into your printer. So how to achieve large scale stuff? It's always a struggle when you come from schools like, uh, like the AA, like me, where we were taught how to use digital fabrication and fab labs, but we are, uh, we're always confronting reality. We're always uh, you know, in between the realm of fiction and reality. Now, I've always tried to make it real and although sure, I might bluff a bit sometimes, uh, I'm always confronted by the delivery of these projects. Um, this is a project, I also, I'm quite lucky to have clients that are a bit open-minded. This is a client coming and saying, I want to 3D print food and I want a restaurant for it. Um, and so we started developing furnitures with him um, and that furniture is interesting because we had to use our printer, which can only do one kilogram of plastic. Um, and therefore all our geometries were generated in uh, the parametric model in order to output exactly uh, the requirements of the printer. So uh, we were printing the food. The technology is starting to sprawl in areas that I could not expect. And then he was invited to do a bigger restaurant in Dubai and so on. Um, and so we tried to modularize our small printer, really to keep things uh, within the, the bounds of our printer, which is slightly uh, big, but still not to the, the scale of a building. So we continued exploring how we could scale up. We just received a monster of a printer, which is called a, a WASP 3MT. And therefore we can uh, section things off um, and print them. In this case, this is called a, uh, a differential growth. It's when you, uh, you know, add curvature towards the edge faster than in the middle. So you have all these curls. 
uh, and therefore uh, the prints are quite efficient, but it's still segmented and will be printed in, in chunk, and mostly it'll be printed in plastic, which is not very uh, fire safe um, and won't let you build big, big things necessarily. Um, other projects that we've worked on was uh, another use of digital fabrication, in this case a laser cutter. This is the Brewer Happold uh, headquarters uh, on Newman Street, and this is a central piece that they commissioned us called the Wooden Wave. Now this is using another side of, uh, let's say, the maker's revolution in which uh, people develop open source techniques. Uh, this is called a lattice hinge, you might have heard of it. Um, and in this case, if you combine this with your parametric tools, you can actually control the curvature of wood. Um, by controlling the curvature of wood, you can create uh, three-dimensional geometries from two-dimensional cuts. Now, after having done a lot of digital fabrication, I thought, okay, well, we go to the desert every year. This is called the Burning Man Festival. Uh, maybe some of you have been um, linked to the Silicon Valley. They love it there. They send their Google and Facebook employees. So last year, we, uh, we did this. This is called Tangential Dream. And it was the idea of not using digital fabrication, just using the logic of the computer to arrange off-the-shelf uh, timber. So off-the-shelf timber, 2x4, two 2x2, by 4x4, four, two by two, four by four, you're all familiar with it. Dimensional lumber, they call it in America. Um, and to or organize it according to a matrix of values that we'd get off our parametric software, namely grasshopper. Um, and so the only thing that varies here really is the, the spacers in between the, um, the planks. And those spacers are basically cut from a, a manual matrix and a, and a circular saw. So what we could do is use standard wood. So the entire project in terms of wood costed $3,000, which is not much compared to our previous projects where we laser cut and so on. And so with the symmetrical aspect to it, with some clever people uh, that came to help us, we could build an entire structure that um, uh, you know, would cost very, very little. But we couldn't use digital fabrication because they're too thick, they're too big uh, members, and, and there's always these constraints. And so extrapolating from there, you know, since it was so cheap and easy to build, we thought, well, okay, well, let's, let's go a bit bigger and so on in order to do the temple at Burning Man, which is the biggest structure there. Um, now, I started thinking, well, wait a second, <laughs> how am I going to build that? Um, obviously, we'd need a huge scaffolding. Uh, it's going to be very impractical. And in the meantime, we were working on this with an architect called Hennigan Peng and Francis Archer, which is how I met him. This is the memorial for uh, the Holocaust. There was a competition recently to build this, uh, and they're going to announce the result very soon. Hopefully, this one will win, but we never know. But then how do, arrange, how do you arrange conventional materials in that things we're used to, you know, concrete blocks, bricks, in a way that creates these really interesting uh, arrangements? You know, in this case, this is called a moiré pattern. Um, and so although the, the materials are the same as what we're used to, uh, the geometry is, is generated through parametric software, but we don't really have ways, apart from doing it from jigs and people doing it from, we don't really have a tool that allows us to do this at that scale. I went to, a, to Bologna, this is WASP's headquarters, uh, <laughs> and they have this huge machine, which is basically scaling up the Delta Tower that we have in our space in London. Um, and then what they have is a little cone here, and they keep on putting mud in there uh, manually, and then uh, it creates a mud cylinder, basically, uh, which is uh, really interesting because that means uh, it comes from the Earth and it, it will eventually goes back, goes back to the Earth. So we got one of those machines, uh, but always noticing that you need twice the height to build half the size of your bed uh, in height. So when Arab uh, suggested we do a competition on, on the future of, of construction, I looked at the current robotic technology for uh, construction. And they're all kind of unscalable to some extent. They do pieces of wall, they do uh, you know, assembly, they're all often using robotic arms that are, were done for you know, the, the, the car industry. They're, they're expensive, they're getting cheaper secondhand, but they also use software that are a bit expensive unless you have uh, open source uh, uh, things that try to hack them and so on. Then I'm like, okay, well, there are the spider cams. Spider cams and cranes are very, very large scale. Um, and we know how to program Delta, Delta printers very, very easily because uh, it uses G-code. So, I started seeing a bit of, you know, uh, 
things that were done here and there with that uh, idea. It was an intuition, but it's, it wasn't really much uh, proven. So looking around, this is uh, something from the University of Washington where they uh, translate um, the, the printer, they invert the compressive arm to be in tension. Uh, but you see it's very unstable. The, the head there is just kind of moving about and, um, and, and, and kind of moving around like this. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I explained to Arab this current uh, situation, saying how we could save time, come with a, a luggage, install the robot, program it fairly fast, and use it for uh, different environments and so on. So, uh, you know, telling them how um, it could allow to link our, our, our software uh, with the construction, but also that we could deconstruct. So you could construct and deconstruct with the same machine. So I explained how this could work, um, uh, unloading components, assembling the platform, um, and so on, calibrating the whole thing, and have an infinity of possibilities uh, with this machine. Um, you know, so this is kind of the timeline of the project. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the exact uh, details of it, but what we uh, started thinking is, okay, so if you have a giant machine in their atrium, this was the first uh, project we, we won, was the idea of using their atrium, we could develop interface for all the employees to submit design based on the constraint of this machine. And that's when we started uh, working with Flux, which is a, um, a company that allows you to uh, exchange files, uh, not on uh, kind of folders like Dropbox, but live from one side of the software to another one. So this is Rhino on our side, this is Rhino somewhere else in the world, and as you move your Rhino on one side, it updates the Rhino on the other side. Um, so a bit like Google Docs, uh, but with, with a three-dimensional object. So if you could start doing that, uh, you could start developing online interfaces, so Grasshopper, think of Grasshopper online, basically, and allow other people to have control over your design. The output of this would really just be the G-code that you need to activate that printer. Um, so we were uh, thinking together of the interface um, and how to link it to a, a, a kind of giant version of what I just showed uh, previously. So, uh, these are some of the processes that we had to go through, um, namely the, the, the clashes. So when you start building such a big frame, uh, you need to think of the positioning of your supports, uh, you know, of the, of the stack in relation to the build volume that you can do. And then you can start of a parametric model in which uh, you have versions that can be lifted and so on and so forth. So that was our very first uh, end effector, uh, which was a magnetic... Uh, kind of uh, magnetic on-off head, uh, which uh, would allow you to pick from the top and place from the top as well. Now, the more you add things in a uh, robotic system, the more there can be failures, the more you add tolerance. So it was a bit of a, of a challenge to start doing it. And this really has been a process of simplification. This is how our, our grasshopper looks. The very beautiful thing about uh, par parallel robotics is that the length of these lines directly translate to a line of code. So we don't need to do things like inverse kinematics and so on and so forth. We actually just send it straight from our computer to that machine. Now this is a very, very early version, very unstable, that we did in our office. Um, it's quite interesting because whilst we were working with like, governmental agencies developing uh, you know, a very, very large version, for Arab, we started doing the same in our office. Um, and Arab came to see those versions, this is in our office, and thought, well, you know, we might as well kind of, you know, continue researching this as a kind of product to be used in different scenarios. So this is the, this like two months after we went to France to do that, that main attempt, and then it pretty much did the same. It's about to lift it, the signal is every five seconds, but we're working on that. Um, and so this, kind of research in-house based on things that are available now. Arduino boards, uh, Firefly for Grasshopper, allowed us to do a version that didn't need all these massive uh, components, so in line with what we were trying to pitch to Arab. So these were different partners we, we, we started working with. This is Fraunhofer in Germany, this is Technalia and Lirm in France, um, and those are the very first tests we did. Now their software, uh, is not very you know, user-friendly in this case. It's, got, uh, it's straight from Visual Studio. You have X, Y, Z coordinate, and they don't have a representational element. They cannot, for example, draw something and the robot does it. Uh, it's not because they would have to program the path with trigonometry and so on. So they started sending us the constraints, uh, the type of files that you need, the rotation that you could do, 
And then we did our own version uh, on Grasshopper and started outputting the .move file that they were using, which is pretty much like G-code, just X, Y, Z rotation, um, and so on. So knowing this, we started uh, seeing what sort of geometry can be built based on that technology. Um, if we wanted to rotate, so you can let the, the, the machine rotate on its own um, by pulling the cables, then what you can do is to actually tell the code, well, if your tower is within a certain angle, go and pick the support uh, that will correspond to that tower um, and then actually match the tower you want to build with the stack that you're building. So we started redoing the different options uh, that we explored and also uh, trying to minimize that frame all around it. You'll see it wasn't necessarily a success because it actually went to that <laughs> and then the clashes were kind of getting a bit extreme. So we were thinking, well, instead of a stack, we could use another tower. So build from one design to the next. Uh, so that instead of building you know, a, a stack and a tower, you'd have two designs and it would dense between the, the designs. Throughout the whole process, Francis Archer, the uh, creative engineer, would keep on sending us picture of his Jenga kit um, and sending us different version. He was very inspired about the, the type of structures you could do and said, I don't believe in parametric design. Um, I think that actually you should let people free to do what they want and your software should recognize the parametric model from the freedom of people. So uh, getting increasingly complex, we started uh, thinking, well, actually, if we want to do something uh, you know, that we can have a feedback loop on, a kind of intelligent machine, then we really need to develop our own system. Um, and we need to kind of think this into a bigger project, a project that could really change uh, the way we approach digital fabrication. So our idea is the Polybot, and it's something we're going to uh, sell eventually. Uh, we're in the process of developing it uh, in our office. Uh, but this is what it is. So it's a machine that comes in a box. Um, you set and calibrate the four corners, and you can use uh, a bed that is, you know, mostly you know, scale less because uh, the only constraint in size is the size of your winches, really. Um, and then have an online interface for you to control this machine. So therefore you could build things like, you know, those walls that you see um, at the ETH, you saw those parametric walls and so on, but at home or outdoors um, from your phone. So I'm gonna stop it there. Uh, we are developing that. I'm hoping end of this month, watch for, the Kickstarter campaign, and if you want to support the project, uh, please do. Thank you very much.